Hi ladies and gentlemen, this is Ms. Skoken. We're back in AP Statistics and we're taking a look at Chapter 6, Random Variables. In Section 6.1, we're going to be looking at both discrete and continuous random variables. If you remember, discrete random variables are the ones that we describe with dots or, in, as the case may be, with a histogram made up of bars with, without having a continuous axis. So these are the ones, the discrete ones are the ones that we would count. Continuous random variables are the ones that we would measure, and these are the ones that kind of blend in one to the other, and we have to use rounding rules so that we know which bar to put a specific piece of data in. Later on in the chapter, we're going to be talking about transforming and combining random variables, as well as two specific distributions, the binomial distribution and the geometric distribution. By the end of this section, we're going to be able to calculate and interpret both the mean and the standard deviation, just a hint, remember standard deviation is the square root of the variance. We're going to describe continuous random variables using our GSOX model, and we're going to be able to apply the idea of discrete and continuous random variables to a variety of different real world problems. Now, if you remember, a probability model is where we have all the possible outcomes and the probabilities associated with each one of those outcomes. When we talk about a random variable, it's a numerical variable that gives us those possible outcomes. And we can create a probability distribution, either a table or an, a graph, of the possible outcomes as well as the frequency with which, or the probability with which each of those occurs. Pause the video if you'd like to read or take notes on the definition, the formal definition for random variable and probability distribution. Consider an example where we have a fair coin, meaning equal likelihood of getting a heads or getting a tails, and we toss that coin three times. This should, in your mind, create a tree diagram where we have three different trials branching out, starting with heads or tails, and branching out until we have a total of eight possible outcomes. That's two, because we have two possible head or tails, to the third power because we have three trials. We're going to define a random variable x as the number of heads obtained as we to cost the, toss the coin three times. And we know that we can get zero heads one way. We can get three heads one way. That's if we get heads, heads, heads. And both one head and two heads, it's a combination of heads and tails resulting in the specific number of heads, because remember that's what we're counting, is counting heads. You can see our probability distribution. Because there's only one way to get tails, 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 or zero heads, we have a probability of one-eighth associated with getting zero heads, and so on with the rest of the distribution. When we graph this, it looks like a histogram that is made up of bars. If you look across the axis, you'll notice that the, I'm sorry, the horizontal axis, we know that these are the possible outcomes for random variable x. And if we look at the vertical, we know that each one of the vertical values is the probability associated with each one of the possible outcomes. Now, we've talked about discrete and continuous. Discrete random variables are, once again, the ones that we would count. And this is where we can list the different possible values of the random variable and the probability associated with each one of them. We have two requirements. Remember that probability is a number between 0 and 1, and the sum of the probabilities of any distribution needs to be exactly 1. To find the probability of any event, we can add the probabilities that make up a specific event. So for example, if we were rolling a die and we wanted to know the probability of getting an even number, we would add up the probability associated with getting a 2, the probability associated with getting a 4, and the probability associated with getting a 6. Let's take a look at an example, and I'm going to pause the video now so you can read the example on page 343. And what we would like to do, first of all, is show that the probability distribution for x is legitimate. Next, make a histogram of the probability distribution and then describe what we see, remember our GSOX, and then C, find the probability that the baby gets an APGAR score of 7 or higher. So in order to find whether or not the probability distribution is legitimate, 
we add up all the probabilities. If the total is one, exactly one, then we know it's a legitimate probability distribution. We show the graph, again, with the possible values of the APGAR score on the horizontal axis and in the vertical axis we graph the probability value. And this distribution, if we were to describe it, we see a tail on the left so we know it's a left skew, it's unimodal, and I guess that's it. <laughs> For part C, we add up the different values associated, the probability values associated with an APGAR score of 7 or higher. So 7, 8, 9, or 10. And remember the word or in probability means we're adding those values together. So there's a probability of 91% that we would have a healthy baby, which is an APGAR score of 7 or higher. When we look at the discrete random variable distributions, we're going to use our GSOCs. And that means shape, center, spread, outliers, and of course gaps. Now, let's talk about the mean of a distribution. The mean of a probability distribution we also call the expected value. And the way that we find it is kind of like a weighted average, where we multiply the value of the variable and the associated probability, and then add up each of those for the whole probability distribution. So we refer to it either as E of X, and this is the expected value of random variable X. We said that it means it's the mean, so there's our mu sub capital or uppercase X. And we can see that what we're actually doing is adding together all of the products, uh, value of the random variable times the, pro the associated probability, okay, for each one of those. Again, let's take a look at the example with the APGAR scores. And what we want to do is get the expected value. You're always going to show it this way in your written work, where you may not show multiplying and adding every single one, but you want to show the first one, 0 times 0 0.001, the second one, 1 times 0 0.006, and then the last one. So you have a plus dot 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 in the middle and then 10 times 0.053. You can see that they showed the first three and then the last one, and of course that's great, but at a bare minimum you want to show the first two and the last one. Sum it all together and we have the expected value. That means in the very, very long term, what is the average APGAR score we would expect to find? And it's this 8.128 value. It doesn't need to be any specific value. It doesn't even need to be one of the choices. You can see 8.128 is not 7, it's not 8, it's not 9, it's somewhere in between. And so it's our expected value, and it means over the very long term, what do we expect to see, okay? Now, we have a little cartoon. Pause the video so you can read the cartoon. And now let's take a look at the standard deviation of a discrete random variable. You remember standard deviation is the average difference between each individual value and the mean value. And it's no different here. The way that we're going to calculate it, of course, is to first find the mean. That's our expected value that we saw a minute ago. The second thing that we're going to do is find the variance. And the variance, we remember, is the square of the standard deviation or the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So what we're going to do is, and you can see in summation notation here, we're going to get the difference between each value and the mean, square the difference, multiply that by the associated probability for that particular value of the random variable, add them all together. That's going to give us the variance. And when we want to finally find the standard deviation, we're going to take the square root of the variance. Okay, so here we go again with this APGAR example, and we're going to expand out this summation notation. And just remember that capital sigma, that uppercase sigma, just means we're going to add them all together. And in this case, our first value is 0. We subtract our mean, square the difference, and multiply by the associated probability. Once again, the same way that we showed for the expected value, we're going to have the first and the second plus dot, 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 and then the last value. Once we add them all together, we have the variance. 
to find the standard deviation, we're going to square root that number, and that gives us a standard deviation. And the interpretation of that is, on average, a randomly selected baby's APGAR score will differ from the mean 8.128, about 1.4 units. So it will differ from the mean, on average, 1.4 times. All right, let's talk about continuous random variables. Okay, continuous random variables, you remember, we use density curves for those. And we have an infinite number of values. When we measure, if we're truly exact, we know that there's an infinite number of decimal places that we could carry it to. So that's where we would use a continuous random variable. And these, once again, are measured values. So let's take a look at young women's heights. Again, pause the video so that you can read the example on page 351 in your textbook. We're going to define y as the height of a randomly chosen young woman. Y is a continuous random variable whose probability distribution is n for normal with a mean of 64 and a standard deviation of 2.7. What's the probability that a randomly chosen woman has a height between 68 and 70 inches? This is no different from what we did in chapter 2. This is a density curve. Remember, always draw the curve and shade the area of interest. We're going to set it up using z-scores, so we write it in probability notation, then convert it to z-score notation and find the area associated with each one of those values and take the difference between those values. We also remember that there's a calculator feature that will do this for us and we're going to use the calculator feature to check our work, but we're still going to show our work in this probability notation, z-score notation, area, and then showing the difference. So in the end, there's about a 5.6% chance that a randomly chosen young woman has a height between 68 and 70 inches. All right, so that actually concludes our discussion of section 6.1. We've learned about random variables and the probability distributions of random variables. We've talked about discrete random variables and continuous random variables, finding the means, which are the expected value, finding the variance and standard deviation, and then calculating an associated probability using z-scores when we have a normal curve distribution. I hope that this helps you understand section 6.1 a little bit and we'll see you back for section 6.2.